Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the eastern border. This time, we'll be looking at what Ekranoplans are and mostly were, but we have some new technological developments in this area. See, this subject comes to me from a thing called the Caspian Sea Monster. The picture of that is on our webpage, in addition to this episode, so go check it out yourselves. That's a true beast that actually caused a massive scare in one of the more interesting spy stories with the CIA. Oh, and it also had nukes on it. Now, imagine a ginormous, ginormous ship that attach wings to it. Make it fly really fast, too. And it's really big, and it carries nukes. Have fun. This scared the crap out of the CIA, and then tried to control it and find out what it was, and how it worked. And it truly does look like something from the Command and Conquer game series. Like, if you've seen Kirov airships, mix them in with some boats, and, well, there you have it. Technically, this is a Lune class Ekranoplan. Not Luna, or Luna in proper Russian, but Lune, which is um, named after a bird, so different. AKA, this one also was known as MD-160. I found out about this and started getting myself involved into this matter after I read that it was beached in the Caspian Sea and it was taken on water, because previously the Caspian Sea monster had crushed into the sea. So let's hope that this thing gets taken to a museum where, well, they had uh, the idea for it, so they took it out of the sea last year, July 31st. But this is crazy. But this also stands as a symbol of one of the things in the Soviet Union that they managed to do right. I mean, they did a lot of things quite okay, but these Ekranoplans, and I'll get to explaining what they are, what's their history, and what do they do, this is one of the craziest Soviet military projects, and as of right now, well, they're still trying to make them, not only in Russia, but in Singapore and South Korea and in the United States. There are some issues with this, but it's an interesting new technology. Sort of-ish new, but we'll get to that. Basically, this MD-60, the Caspian Sea Monster, and as all Ekranoplans, it was designed to fly by taking the effect of the so-called wing-in-ground effect. Normally, standard planes experience this effect only during takeoff and landing, but Ekranoplan, by the way, in scientific literature from which I'm taking most of this episode, they're always named wing-in-ground effects, or WIG uh, vehicles, because is it a plane? Is it a ship? You know. But I'm just going to be calling them Ekranoplans, as this term is often used to describe all the class of these vehicles, sometimes only specific ones, but, you know, it's better to just say Ekranoplan, not Ekranoplane, Ekranoplan, because it's a Russian word, and rather than saying this W-I-G vehicle, it's kind of weird. They have a lot of issues, a lot of specifics, but they are an interesting subspecies of a um, boat plane, so to speak. Of course, they also carried nukes and, you know, that would be used in, in some real massive war, but they had their limitations, for example, their range, as the Soviets had built them, was only 1,500 kilometers. So that kind of limits their use as a transport carrier, but, well, they uh, would find uses for that anyways. And this Lun, by the way, the, the Russian word for Harrier, originally mounted eight NK-87 turbo fans, six missile tubes mounted on its back, and it had a wingspan of 44 meters or 144 feet. Yeah, it was big. And, uh, yeah, the fun story about it, it served in the Russian Navy from the late 1980s through the late 1990s before being laid up in Kaspisk until 2020. On July 31st that year, the vehicle was taken under tow for a move to Drebent, Dagestan, because, you know, that's one of the oldest cities in Russia, and that's in the Caucasus region. And, um, yeah, this whole thing came up where this was to be displayed in the future Grand Patriotic Park, and the Museum of Russian Military Might. You know, all this cool technology and all that stuff. However, when they kind of pulled out the Caspian Sea monster from the Caspian Sea, the problem was that um, this Luny, or the big monster, arrived at the site before it was discovered that there was nowhere to put the aircraft in the first place. Also, aircraft employed by the Navy... Eh. So, they just uh, stuffed it on a beach because... Apparently, that whole museum park wasn't even built there. And it's been sitting there ever since. The locals have been tried to pull it ashore by hand, but... Yeah, not very successful. 
Interestingly enough, the original discovery of Russia's secret Okrana plant tests in 1967 really did cause a stir in the United States. The predecessor to the Lun was labeled KM of the wings for Korabel Maket, meaning prototype ship. So when spy satellites and YouTube plane photos showed a monstrous aircraft with tiny wings taxing for testing, the CIA nicknamed the Okrana plant the Caspian Monster, without we being aware of what it actually was, and it was a massive massive list of swear words and, and panic there, according to, well, my sources. One of the reasons the CIA was working on unmanned drone surveillance technology via Project Aquiline as early as the mid-1960s was actually the supposed threat posed by craft like the KM or the Loon or everything. And this is kind of crazy because, you know, I'm putting the same image on my website from uh, hisaton.com or covered shores, and the original goal of this Ekranoplan research was to create a vessel that could move almost as quickly as an airplane, while remaining below the minimal altitude because it wouldn't be detected by radars. And, of course, we have used smaller Ekranoplans that they have been experimented with by various countries. Currently, there are no monsters the size of this whole megastructure thing. And they're not really a major component of any plant transportation networks worldwide. This, however, is a rather fascinating and, I'd say, extremely interesting example of a futuristic technology, kind of a what-if, that might have proved popular if the technology had been developed differently, and if some of the, you know, the stats of this massive thing had turned out a bit differently. But, you know, the Kranoplans are one of the weird Soviet things that truly deserves their story to be told to the wider public. So that's what we're doing this time. Oh, and probably next one too, because this is looking to be a um, quite a big episode. So, before we cut to the story of the Kranoplans themselves and how they were built and, well, what are they even like, we kind of have to figure out how did they even fly and what they are. Technically, these are, like I said, wing and ground effect crafts. And although a lot of my sources, out of which one of the Biggest ones is Russia's Akranoplans, Caspian Sea Monster, and other WIG craft by Seria Komisarov. And another important source that I'm using is WIG Craft and Akranoplan Ground Effect Technology by Lion Yoon, Ian Bliot, and Johnny Du. These guys are engineers and they provide all the knowledge to me about how this whole technology works and they're very, you know, dry and scientific. Meanwhile, the Caspian Sea Monster and other crafts is more about the history of this stuff, plus various other articles. Just letting you know that these books uh, seem to be written in early 2000s, so not as recent about the modern developments. For those, I had to take a look at modern-day articles, and I'm, well, obviously not an expert on Navy crafts or planes. My thing's more like tanks. I'm a treadhead. I used to play Imperial Guard and, and Warhammer 40k, after all. So, you know, I'll just be saying Ekranoplans instead of WIG crafts, even though WIG vehicles or WIG crafts is the preferred term. Just so someone listening in on this whole thing from a more specialized field understand that, uh, hey, I know what I'm talking about here. However, this thing will get a bit technical at the beginning. Because, well, we kind of have to, just like in our tank episodes. So what are these wing and ground effect crafts? Apparently, they make use of a mm, dynamic air cushion and they operate in a close proximity to a supporting surface. They use the air to push down on the thing below and use this effect created there, which is what airplanes use when taking off or, or landing. And no, it's not as efficient as flying very high, but it also can just skim over the surface. It's kind of like, kind of like hovercraft in a way. It is related to it, but not really. Now, this thing doesn't only operate over water, it can operate over land, but that's only provided that the ground surface is sufficiently even and flat, which means that, you know, it's mostly water, but not only. A feature common to an aircraft and an ekranoplan is wings that generate lift due to aerodynamic forces. However, in the case of the ekranoplan, this lift is augmented owing to the ground effect created by compression of... Mm, ram airstream between the wings and the supporting surface. A higher lift-to-drag ratio enables an ekranoplan to obtain the same lift at lower speeds and lower engine power compared to aircraft. As a result, the ekranoplans are, in principle, and that surprised me, actually more fuel-efficient compared to the aircrafts. 
But that's on paper, really, because they lack maneuverability. For example, an airplane can, you know, twist around, you know, to sides when it wants to turn, same as motorcycles do. Meanwhile, ekranoplans need to slow down as they cannot do the the same manures, otherwise one of their wings will just pop into water, and then to turn, a crown of plants need to slow down and then speed up again, which also leads to consumption, but if you look at, like, on paper, on a pure straight line, it is theoretically, well, more fuel efficient compared to aircraft. And it would theoretically combine that with enlarged carrying capacity like that of a ship. However, when talking about this fuel efficiency, you know, since large flat areas on land are not a common occurrence, I mean, even Siberia has a ton of forests and whatever. Ekranoplans are, in most cases, intended for use over water. Operation from the surface of lakes, rivers, or seas of necessity introduces some features of waterborne vessels into the design of, of these ekranoplans. Historically, a number of ekranoplans emerged as a kind of attempt to lift waterborne craft out of the water for the purpose of achieving greater speeds, and in many cases, these were built at shipyards. And... Yeah, this is why there is this question that, you know, should you really consider these new crafts as very low-flying aircraft? Or as ships that have lifted themselves out of the water? I mean, if you look at the Caspian monster, it's definitely hard to figure out what it actually is. Now, it seems that both definitions might be appropriate, since the concept of ekranoplans embraces a wide variety of craft featuring quite substantial differences. They may tend to be closer to one or the other of the two extremes, depending on how they're built and, you know, what and who builds them, but generally speaking, they're always something of a complex and a hybrid. On the one hand, an ekranoplan in cruise flight is subject to aerodynamic forces, much in common with conventional aircraft, while the hydrodynamic forces act on it only during takeoff and landing, or rather, alighting, because it doesn't really, you know, land as much as it goes to the sea, for the most part, on the other hand, these ekranoplans operating in close proximity of the water surface in a marine environment have to be subjected to the same rules and requirements as, you know, conventional ships and boats and other marine vessels in terms of traffic safety and whatnot, because they don't really fly the high of the water. The latter consideration, by the way, played an important role when it came to establishing formal classification of these ekranoplans with the view of adopting rules concerning their certifications and safety regulations and actually who gets to basically drive them. So, the Soviets, and later Russians, adopted the three basic categories of ekranoplans, and we'll talk about all of them, because those things really show how weird this stuff sometimes could get. Now, as usual, these namings of these types aren't very innovative. The first of them, type A, encompasses vehicles that can be operated only within the height of the surface effect. They uh, usually feature wings of low aspect ratio, and are fitted only with a rudder, there being no elevator, the driver, or, you know, should we say helmsman, doesn't have to possess any piloting skills and steers the vehicle much in the same way as an ordinary speedboat. In Russian parlance, such vehicles are termed dynamic air cushion vehicles, or ekranoplan boats. Now, there are some designs from this, such as the Volga 2, Amphistar, and Raketa 2. The second category, type B, includes vehicles which are capable of leaving the surface effect zone for a short while and making brief hops. And this is important because the altitude of such a hop is basically just the minimum safe altitude of flight for aircraft as determined by International Civil Aviation Organization. That is, 150 meters or 500 feet. Again, in Russian parlance, such vehicles are regarded as standard WIG craft, or ekranoplans proper. They feature wings with an aspect ratio of up to 3 and are provided with elevators. These now have to be controlled by aircraft pilots. And this is, again, we have Orlyonok, kind of a sad design, this KKM, which I mentioned in the intro, and there are some others. Now, there's this third category, which is already a different beast. These are ekranoplans, which are capable of flying outside the surface effect zone for a considerable time, and climbing to altitudes just like, you know, regular aircraft. But they can't do it for prolonged periods. This classification, subdividing the ekranoplan vehicles into these three types, was formulated by Russian organizations and submitted later on by Russia to, well, this International Marine Organization and International Civil Aircraft Organization for their consideration, because you had to do both. And, yeah, this whole formalization, because, again, if you've listened to some previous episodes, the Soviets liked their paperwork and they liked to determine everything perfectly. Interestingly enough, this allowed to reach, within the framework of this IMO, an agreement to a number of basic issues 
pertaining to legal, technical, and operational aspects of our chronoplans. Because seriously, there is such a thing as maritime law, and the very idea that the chronoplans have to abide by it already is complex. Because that's a boat plane, basically. And currently, at least the writing in 2002, there have been actually international documents that were created that actually provide rules for commercial operation of chronoplans and for their own safety. And this is a really important milestone, I want to stress this, because currently at that point when they were given, this is an expression at a high level for an international recognition of chronoplans as a new and promising means of maritime transport. And these really provide a legal basis for its further development and commercial operation on international sea routes. And I, again, stressing this because this is what South Korea and Singapore and other countries that are now experimenting with these vehicles, because they went built more properly than the Soviets did, they could show great potential for civilian use. Now, their military use remains uh, currently dubious at best, but at least we have some documentation about these things that, well, many other technologies actually would lack. Now, now that you know that we have legally settled the fact that a Kranoplan is kind of both a boat and a plane, and what it is and what it works like, well, let's look at the story of how they were designed and produced in Russia, Ukraine, the Baltics, and the Soviet Union. Because, well, all of this was a part of Soviet Union, but you really kind of have to put things in some perspective. Hello there, thank you for tuning in into another episode of The Eastern Border. We are so happy to announce that this episode is brought to you by our friends at Rusansov.com. If you're looking to buy new art, don't forget to use the code Eastern Border for a discount on us. Remember, head over to Rusansov.com and happy shopping! If, however, you want to support our show directly, head over to Patreon.com or our website TheEasternBorder.lv to find out how you can help out. For all things Eastern Border, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Discord. And, as always, thank you so much for supporting us. We really appreciate each and every one of you. That's all from me now. See you online. This podcast brought to you by RussianVoiceOvers.eu. Enjoy! The early research on ground effect and on efforts aimed at creating practicable ground effect vehicles dates back as early as the 1920s and 1930s, when work in this field was started in several countries. Uh, by the way, the first self-propelled Kekranoplan, well, as Russians would call it, but at this point it really is just a ground effect vehicle, was built by T. T. Kario, a Finnish engineer, in 1935. Soviets obviously was among the first experimental countries. Theoretical and experimental work in this direction was started in the USSR by the 1920s, which involves work by Yuryev in 1923. Further work followed in the late 1930s, when a whole set of theoretical studies and experiments in the field of ground effect research was performed by Yakov Serebrinsky and Byanuchev. The results of this work were published in really specialized literature, and sadly I don't have access to that. In the late 1930s, the first steps in practical design of ekranoplans in the Soviet Union were made by Pavel Ignatievich Gorchovsky, an aviation engineer and an inventor renowned for his energy and innovative ideas. However, it is Rostislav Yevgenievich Alexeyev, who lived from 1916 to 1980, who was an outstanding designer and engineer and scientist who must be credited with having played a paramount decisive role in shaping this course of this crazy research and, well, basically building these ekranoplans, which truly are amazing. He created the conceptual approach and design philosophy. He could truly be regarded as one of the founders of the Russian wing ship construction and everything. He started his activities as a builder of hydrofoil ships, and in his capacity as the chief of the Central Hydrofoil Design Bureau, or um, abbreviated TSKPOSPK, Centralne Konstrukskorskoye Bureau po sodach po sudnam na povodnach kriach. Sorry, this text has uh, Latinized versions of, of Russian, and I'm like, what? what? This is not pronounced this way. Fine. Centralne Konstruktskoye Bureau po sudnam na povodnach krilach. It's just weird. It was set up in Nizhny Novgorod. An impressive range of highly successful hydrofoil vessels designed under his guidance was developed and put into operational service. Yet it was precisely his work on the Kranoplans 
uh, which was obviously in top secret status for many, many years, that was really designed to and destined to become the most prominent and significant part of his creative work and everything. And, well, I personally think that, yeah, we need something crazy and innovative, even if it doesn't really work out that well or isn't successful in the first attempt, because, like I said, we're still doing it. And maybe we're going to do it better, because, hey, like, having a faster, cooler boat, if we can overcome its flaws, that would be really nice. The Central Hydrofall Design Bureau has been actively engaged in Ekranoplan design since the early 1960s. The work was based on the concept of auto-stabilization of the wing of an Ekranoplan relative to the interface between the supporting water surface and the air. This concept proved quite sound and was subsequently incorporated in all Ekranoplan projects issued by the design bureau. On its basis, a search was initiated for suitable aerohydronamical layouts. Initially, one of these featured two sets of wings arranged in the tandem. The first, 3 ton or 6,600 pound Ekranoplan built in 1961, was fitted with two sets of wings. Research revealed later on that the tandem layout is practicable only in very close proximity to the surface and is unable to ensure the necessary measure of stability and safety once the craft leaves this close proximity. Experiments with one of those tandem wing machines ended in a crash. Because, well, yeah, first of many, as we'll see in this episode. Alexeyev arrived at the decision to make use of a classic aircraft layout, one set of wings and a tail unit, which was to be subjected to modifications designed to ensure, well, more stability and controllability during cruise flight and ground effect. In particular, low aspect ratio wings were adopted, which is, like I said, around three. An important feature was the use of an outsized horizontal tail. It was to be placed sufficiently far aft and high up relative to the main wings, so as to minimize the influence of downwash introduced by the wings, depending on their flight at altitude and pitch angle. Ten experimental ekranoplans featuring this layout were built by the Central Hydrofall Design Bureau. Their weight and dimensions becoming better with every successive machine, because if there is not a machine that weighs 20 metric tons, then the Soviets consider it not worth building anyways. Bigger is better, comrades. These were the machines in the SM series. SM stands for Samochodne Medjil, self-propelled model, with an all-up weight up to 5 tons, or 11,000 pounds. Design experience gained by Alexeyev in developing these machines enabled him to take a bold decision to initiate the design of gigantic, truly gigantic, ekranoplans, with an all-up weight of more than 400 tons, or 880,000 pounds. In 1962, the Central Design Bureau was engaged in project work on a combat ekranoplan intended for anti-submarine warfare, weighing 450 tons, or 990 pounds. Two years later, the design team in Nizhny Novgorod started designing the T-1 Troop Transport and Assault Ekranoplan. And man, this is just amazing. I, mean, I like the sound of this so much. T-1 Troop Transport and Assault Ekranoplan. And if any of you are, you know, aspiring science fiction authors or something, hey, put in Troop Transport and Assault Ekranoplans armed with nukes. It's like peanut butter and jelly, which I have never eaten, but apparently those things go really well together. Now, it should be kind of noted that the very considerable scope attained by the activities of the Central Hydrofoil Design Bureau was due to the fact that new means of transport had attracted a lot of interest on the part of the military. As a consequence, for many years, this work was extremely classified. So, the construction of Ekranoplans in the Soviet Union got a boost from military programs. In the opinion of military specialists, both in the Soviet Union and today in Russia, and in the West, Large ekranoplans can be employed for a wide range of missions in the armed forces, notably in the Navy. These include troop transportation, anti-submarine warfare, anti-shipping strikes with guarded missiles, launching nukes, you know, and the works. Tra troop transportation, however, like I said, well, wouldn't work well in the Soviet models because landing troops would be a massive problem, doing so fast and efficient would be quite bad. It could work as, you know, transport planes or, you know, portable nuke launchers that they would be practical and detectable by radar, but, you know, is seeing as you really need to bomb the place before you land something, uh, that's one of the kinks that they really, really had to work out in the end. And uh, the craziest part was the fact that these were supposed to kind of also counter aircraft carriers, because this could, like, fly close to one and blow it up, which would be cool. But the most interesting project of all of this, the most ambitious use of Ekranoplans, involved making these as flying aircraft carriers. So you have basically a ginormous aircraft carrier-sized boat that's flying, and while it's flying, it's also carrying smaller planes. And 
This is an old meme, but it's like, I put a plane on your plane so you can plane while you plane. On a boat. Because everything's better on a boat. Even the aircraft carriers are better if they have wings, and it's just a bit of a mind-boggling thing. Meanwhile, yeah, meanwhile, the Caspian monster itself was a massive, massive nuke carrier. See, an inherent advantage of these Akranoplans when used in warfare is their ability to remain undetected by enemy radar thanks to the low altitude of their flight. The lack of contact with the sea surface makes them undetectable by acoustic means, which is sonars also. Akranoplans are capable of operating not only over water expanses, but also over snow-covered stretches of land and over ice fields. This makes them very suitable for use in polar regions. Their high speed, which is truly high, ensures their quick response to the changing battlefield situation, and their high load carrying capacity enhances their capability of accomplishing various missions and carrying a wide range of weapons. However, you have to take in mind that maneuverability is uh, a bit low. And in assessing the suitability of the Kranoplans for anti-submarine warfare, you know, you should remember that owing to their low flight altitude, these vehicles can't be equipped with uh, sonar boys. However, they possess a wider range of capabilities for making use of a dunking sonar when afloat. Moreover, thanks to their huge dimensions, they can, again, in principle and on paper, theoretically, be fitted with anti-submarine weapons, normally carried by surface ships, to be used without getting airborne. Also, these aircraft plans are superior to amphibious aircraft in seagoing capabilities and endurance. They can be armed with more potent missiles possessing longer range. However, they have the limitations associated with the need for target designation from an external source, which could be provided by amphibious seaplanes, because, you know, they can provide target designation for their weapons when flying at high altitude. The projects for an anti-submarine warfare at a Kranoplan and the T-1 troop carrying a Kranoplan never really left a drawing board. On the other hand, in 1966, the design to bro built in response to an order from the Navy. The KM Ekranoplan, a mock-up, the prototype ship. With its fuselage length of nearly 100 meters or 330 feet, wingspan of nearly 40 meters, 130 feet, and weight of 430 tons, 948,000 pounds, this gigantic machine was a unique piece of engineering. In a record setting flight, its weight reached 540 tons, 1,190,000 pounds, which was an unofficial world record for flying machines at the time. And uh, the KM Ekranoplan, first thing that was deemed to be the Caspian Sea monster in the West. Again, one article stated that the Luñ came after that, the other says it's the KM-1, but hey, it's a top secret project, and in the Soviet era, which sadly, well, most people don't have full access to, so one of these massive monsters is the Caspian Sea monster, which was in the West. This obviously underwent comprehensive testing in the course of 15 years of operation. It marked the completion of a whole range of research and practical design tasks associated with the approbation of the Ekranoplan concept as a whole and involving the scientific basis for their design, construction and testing. The results of this work made it possible to create a theoretical and methodological basis for designing and building actually quite better, all but, you know, smaller examples of Ekranoplans. This is where the story gets really interesting. Now, before we get to the other Ekranoplans and more, uh, weird, interesting parts of their history, together with some more crashes and some more stories. You know, this uh, looks like a two-parter, so gotta finish this one with some eloquence and whatnot. The first thing is I wanted to look at the Caspian Sea Monster's armaments, the non-nuclear missile type. However, you know, they could carry nukes as well. The thing was armed with six anti-ship missiles called P-217 Mosquit. Well, Obviously, it's a mosquito. That thing is a supersonic ramjet-powered cruise missile, and its NATO reporting name is SSN-22 Sunburn. This thing was designed by the Raduga, or Rainbow, design bureau during the 1970s as a follow-up to the SS-9N Siren. The Mosquit was originally designed to be ship-launched, but variants have been adapted to be launched from land, from modified trucks, underwater, from submarines, and air, reportedly the Suhoi Su-33, which is a naval variant of Suhoi Su-27, as well as, famously, for the Luñ class Ekranoplan. Then again, yeah, my sources truly confirm that the KM was built, and then it was tested, and then the Loon was introduced, and the Caspian Sea Monster was applied to both of them? 
Currently, it's the Luny model that is the new Caspian Sea monster because the KM model was repurposed. It's a bit shady, really. I will presume it's the Luny class one and the KM one got either modified into that or something, but they're both were like super huge because the sources vary immensely from really scientific book to scientific book. Now, Moskit is fun and games because the missile can carry conventional and nuclear warheads. One of its warheads is 320 kilograms or 710 pounds of explosives or 120 kiloton of TNT fission fusion thermonuclear warhead. Ah, uh, I like when something goes into 120s. The um, exact classification of the missile is as of now unknown with batting types reported. This uncertainty is due to the secrecy surrounding, well, still very much an active military weapon. The musket is actually just one of the missiles known by this SSN-22 sunburn, because, well, multiple things can be put into this ship and launched from the same kind of outfit, and it looks very similar to everything. Musket reaches a speed of Mach 3 at high altitude and Mach 2.2 at low altitude. This speed is triple the speed of the subsonic American Harpoon. When slower missiles like the Harpoon or the French Exocet are used, the maximum theoretical response time for the defending ship is 120 to 150 seconds. This long response time provides time to launch countermeasures and employ jamming before deploying hard defense tactics such as launching missiles and using quick-firing artillery. But the high speed of 3MA2 Mosquito missiles reduce the maximum theoretical response time for the defending ship to 25 to 30 seconds. This short response time makes jamming and countermeasures very difficult, and firing missiles and quick-firing artillery even more difficult. The Mosquite was designed to be employed against smaller NATO naval groups in the Baltic Sea, which would be countering Danish and German forces, and the Black Sea for, against Turkey and non-NATO vessels in the Pacific, like Japanese, South Korean, etc., and to defend the Russian mainland against NATO amphibious assaults. Variants of the missile have been designated 3M80M, 3M82, which is Osmosquit M. The P-270 designation is believed to be the initial product codename for the class of missile, with the Russian Ministry of Defense, Grau, designated the exact variant of the missile. The 3M-80 was its original model. The 3M-80M model, also named 3M-80E for export, was a 1984 longer-range version of the missile, with the latest version with the longest range being the 3M-82 Mosquito M. So, right now, this missile has been purchased and adopted by the People's Liberation Army Navy of China and of that of India. The minimum effective range of this missile is 10 kilometers, and the maximum for uh, 3M80E and 3M80E1 is 120 or 100 kilometers. The missile flight speed is 2,800 kilometers per hour, with cruising altitude being 20 meters. So, you know, launch ready this time from missile power on until first launch is 50 seconds, and from combat ready status 11 seconds. Inter missile launch time in a Solvo is 5 seconds. And, well, it's a pretty nifty beast. Why am I telling you this? Well, like I said, the Luny class model of Ekranoplan was intended to be an anti-aircraft carrier ship. And could also carry nukes. So I figured I should give you a kind of a way to show you how, for example, United States Navy would fare against this when, you know, you can't really see the thing on a radar because it's flying super low. And a single one of these could just Lop down an aircraft carrier, theoretically. They had other issues, but this is for you, military types out there, out of whom a lot of you actually listen to my show, to ponder whether or not a Ekranoplan, which again, I'll be picturing next to this episode on the show, could provide sufficient threat to United States military, and what could the response be? If you have any comments on that, please, please leave them at the webpage, theeasternborder.lv, or at our Facebook page, or just for me on Twitter, because I'm really curious. Since, well, I obviously am not an expert on all these weird planes and, and military technology, specifically when it comes from the United States side. So hey, if you have anything to add, please do. And as usual, thanks for enjoying this episode. Next time we'll continue with the Akranoplans, and then we'll get back to um, a bit more ancient history. But I'm just fascinated, and I hope you guys also enjoy when I'm making these purely technical stuff, because... Well, say what you want, but when it came to military things, yeah, Soviets had a real knack for building such items, and, well, it's kind of interesting. I hope you feel the same way. However, this is it for now, and do свидания, товарищ.
Thank you for listening to the Eastern Border Show. If you have any questions or comments, go to our website, theeasternborder.lv, and leave a comment there. Or email us at theeasternborder at gmail.com. We'll be sure to answer. You can also follow us on social media and contact us there. If you enjoyed this episode, then leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. It really helps us grow the show. And remember, happiness is mandatory. <laughs>